interesting uh, definition of the recursion in last talks. In particular, you saw how to produce recursive way. In the recursive way, some mapping that would combine functions and attach more space of all the remote surfaces. And so um, I want to explain some of one of the first prototypes of such a recursion, which is from the work of Ezahani. And what she did was expressing the constant function one. I want to recall a, a basic property of passable metric on surfaces, which is the color level, which is very useful. And it gives a description of the metric on the surface here, a simple construct. The fixed gamma, which is a simple closed geodesic. Say that there exists an embedded so isometrically embedded cylinder, so segment minus W W cross S one into a surface. So here to start with the resume that sigma is closed. So that phi is zero. It's just gamma. So this means that we have somewhere in sigma or curve gamma. And I can embed a small cylinder here. Sigma is described in a very simple way. It's going to be dr squared plus l length of gamma squared um, this dt squared, where r and the exponential of 2i pi t are coordinates there. So it's quite easy to describe what are the geodesic looking like in this cylinder. Um, just going there. But it never Because this curve here becomes longer and longer. Um, and the key point is that you also know what, so such a thing exists for some positive W, but you also have a nested lower bound of what can W be. And W gamma. It's arc cinch of one over the length, uh, the cinch of the length of gamma. So this term is quite useful in general in hyperbolic geometry because if you imagine that you have a curve here, which is very small, 
very short, it means that you would have a huge cylinder here. So you must have a curve like cross, which is very long. And conversely, if that thing is very big, then you can only say that the curve that cross goes into a cross like this, the contribution of this part of the surface would be very small. If you have a bordered surface, uh, for example, you can have a similar result near the border. You can just double the surface along the border. So the general idea of Mendahani identity um, is that we have a hyperbolic metric. And one, so in particular, it induces a unit P parameterization of the boundary, of say the first boundary. see what happens. And depending on what happens, we're going to define a partition of V1. And so 1 will be equal to 1 over L1 times the sum over the measure of each of the segment partitioning the V1. And that's going to be the identity we want. Again.
it must be observable. So of course here I start orthogonally, but then if I do this, I cross my step, I won't be able to follow the deck. And then I could continue and maybe hit some other boundary. And in general, I won't intersect it orthogonally. Or I could come back here, not orthogonal, so that's not an orthogonal. So if we define E a set of points in V1, so that gamma x is an orthogonality, we want to understand a little bit um, what is the set E. I mean, is it very frequent that you have an orthogonality? Uh, because we're going to use that set to cut V1 into many pieces. So the First lemma is that E has other measure zero. Other dimension zero. So it's not trivial at all. The idea of the proof is the following. So first, we use a result of Gilman and series. We say that if you take a closed hyperbolic surface, the union of all closed, simple closed geodesics so there's a subset of sigma, has causal dimension one. It's also not frequent in the surface, in a hyperbolic surface, to have a closed geodesic, which is simple, doesn't cross itself. Because the union of all of them doesn't think and mush the set. If I just take one simple closed geodesic, of course it has Hausdorff dimension one. And if I take the union of all of them, I don't increase the Hausdorff dimension. So uh, we accept this. And then, of course, if I intersect, so I could call that x sigma. And if I intersect, it's not really the union of the sets of simple closed. Yes, it's the union of the simple closed. Of the support. Uh -huh. So if you intersect this set with the color neighborhood of B1, because if you just take the interior of this color neighborhood, it's an open set, so I still get something of other dimension. One or maybe less than one. So if you look at E for all points in X, you can also look at the union of all gamma X intersecting with the color neighborhood. So this is going to be included here. But in the color neighborhood, we know very well what's the, what are the metrics and what are the geodesic. If you start here, you don't have much choice. So you have some kind of product structure for, for this set. This is something like gamma x cross some. There are actually some gamma x cross your epsilon in it. In other words, if you project this to the boundary, you're just going to drop one cross dimension by one. 
the dimension one just coming from taking the boundary and extending those curves. But if you project all those curves, and that's the source of the host of the dimension that you have, which is one. So I don't understand. If I take the geodesic, can I take the intersection with its color neighborhood? Why the intersection is not the curve itself? Why is it not what? I mean, if, it, if I start from gamma and I consider the color neighborhood and I consider the intersection between the twos, why is this not going to be the curve itself, the geodesic itself, gamma? Well, it could be longer. I mean, I could go out of the color neighborhood. OK. So ah, I'm just saying right. I look at the beginning. Oh, it's the color neighborhood of the of B1. Oh, um, yeah, of B1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh -huh. so by this product structure argument, uh, this implies, so this has causal dimension greater than one. And so it implies that E itself has causal dimension less than zero, so zero. So it's not very frequent at all to have a of Now, um, you can describe more precisely what are the points in B. That's what we have. I need it here, we just accept the result. So the point in E is isolated. If and only if gamma x meets so the end point uh, and gamma x meets the boundary. And it ends, so it must be orthogonally, or it can skewel around the boundary. So that's corresponding to an aggregated point in E. So it, it's not going to be orthogonal, but it's never going to intersect. Yes. So we it can intersect at infinity. Okay. And x is a limit point. But if it intersects at infinity, how can it do it orthogonally? Because in the definition. It does not. That's why I separated the two definitions. Either it meets a boundary. Uh -huh. And it's n, and because by definition it must be orthogonal, or just pivotal. It means never meet, it never meets it, so then there's no orthogonality condition. Okay. So we have a limit point if and only if gamma x is spiraling around a simple closed curve. in the interior of the not how much of it is on it.
I could also have a case where that's my surface. And I have a geodesic here, which is going to spiral here. And then there's a limit instead of uh, limiting points, it's just a simple cross curve in the interior. So in that case, that's a limit point. Okay. So now we're going to take V1 and I will remove all the limit points in E from it. So that's a set of house dimension zero. And we call that V1 prime. So because it's a set of house dimension zero, what this is must be some countable union of segments. Ugly, but we'll see how to manipulate that I mean, to actually make it completely explicit to the right hand side. And here, of course, there will be the measure of the things are removed, but that's measure zero. Somehow, what's important is that what happens at the boundary of the segments, you have exactly this case where you have these limit points. So it's something in between. For example, it can start to cross some boundary at some angle, maybe not orthogonally. It could intersect itself. And when you vary the shooting point on the segment, you just go transition continuously from all of that. But we will stop when we arrive to this behavior here. is going to be B1, on the right decomposed, on the, on the surface. So we basically have three situations to consider. So this is my B1.
it may cross itself. And then it could continue, but I stop it at the first crossing point. Another possibility. is that it's going to come back to the same boundary, but not orthogonal. Or maybe orthogonally, actually this, if it's come orthogonally back, and that's another little point, so I put it back in one prime. But at least we should be orthogonal, so one of the two. At least here we have, that's true, here I should go maybe. The other possible behavior is that I go to another boundary. Which I will call M for some M. So here the surface is doing something. And here I arrive there. Maybe in an oblique way or also, but only, or even I could spew it around it. But still, I can still say that it's going to this boundary. So in each of these pictures, on top of this boundary D1, I can draw by thickening a bit this gamma x um, two free homotopy class of curves, cross curves, relative to the boundary. So here is one. Is the one which is inside the lasso. And if I thicken and I use the, the outer boundary, I also have that. Here I can do the same, there are two sides. Here, well, we then have two distinguished curves, this one and the one, and then I have this closed curve. So we get two, and I want to consider those things just up to out. Three homotopy classes, three because I don't have base points relative to the boundary of simple cross curves. Because obviously I have a representative of that homotopy class, which is a, a curve that don't in the second side. And now we have the result, which is true when you do. Um, at the big geometry, that in each of these homotopy class, you have a geodesic representative. So take a gamma gamma prime geodesic representative. And this is unique. claiming that when you take these three curves, they bound together a pair of ant with a medium interior in the surface. So if you look at these pictures, depending on you can manipulate in your head, it's not always obvious to see a pair of ant. So we just draw topologically equivalent pictures, where it's perhaps clearer. here, so my surface is in the interior, and in the first case I was shooting a geodesic and it was crossing itself. So I had 
two curves. I have this one. And I also have the one where I just go all around. But that here, I see now I can homotopy to just something like that. And then the rest of the surface is inside. So here you see obviously it bounds a pair of pentacles here with three boundaries. So you can do it the same in the two other situations. So in that case you're just coming to the same boundary, so you have something like that. And I have two curves, which are here and here. So they're going to have a pair of ten. And finally, I could also be in a situation where that's my first boundary. Somewhere there's my second boundary. And my curve is going from there to there. In that case, the last curve that I draw is from the top to that. So I can get a curve. So a simple question is it clear, for example, can it happen that, that inside a yellow one, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any, like it's, it's just a disk? Um, it's contractible, this kind of happen. So what would happen in that case? I don't think in that case you can have a geodesic. Uh -huh. Because we must have uh, a geodesic representative element. Yeah, in its free homotopy class, it will have the null homotopy pure representative. Mm -hmm. Which is which not not okay. mm -hmm. So by, by this thing here, yeah. you cannot. So to any x in V1 prime, we associated some Px, which is this. And conversely, you can ask if you're given such an embedded pair of pen with jersey boundaries, what are the points x? for which it appears in this way. So let's look at the given a given amount pair of times. Somewhere I have its boundaries, the boundaries of the pair of pens. And it could be that one of these curves is a boundary of the surface. I just take Q. several finitely many distinguished geodesics. One of them is a geodesic between B1 and this boundary. So it represents the shortest distance between these two curves. So because the shortest distance, the only way it should be orthogonal here and here. I call this one R prime, and there's a similar one R or the shortest distance between here and here. Then, 
if you move a bit here, you're just going to have a geodesic that continues to cross, but maybe not orthogonal because not anymore the shortest curve. But you would arrive at some point where you try to force it to hit, but it cannot hit anymore, so it will spiral. There is a canonically defined geodesic which will just go around. And meet at infinity. That's a point I did not pull one. And I can draw the same on the other side. If I start here, I will heat at some angle. And if I move, 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 at some point I will have a curve that's spiral on that. Whenever I have, I will have every pair of friends, I always have these two distinguished points on the, on the boundary I start with. I also have that curve, which is the, the seam of this pair of friends. It starts orthogonally here, and goes here in the shortest possible way. So that's an orthogeodesic. Okay, so now imagine that you look only at this pair of, like, pair of pants on the surface. When, for which points on the boundary when you shoot, you're going to see exactly that pair of pants by the previous construction. So we have two possibilities. I mean, first, imagine that this is a BM. Because my pair of pants, so it has two boundaries in common to the surface. And here there's some, the third boundary, gamma. So, when does it happen that when I shoot, I will get exactly that pair of pants? So, let's look at this for the moment. So it's in fact that thing. It's exactly a limit point in E as we defined before. If I'm here, when I shoot, I'm going to cross there. But from the point of view of my construction before when I had gamma x, here it is simple. Nothing happened here, so I, this was some interior curve in the surface, so I just continue. And I will go further away. So I would have forgotten about that particular pair of pants. So whenever I shoot from here, I'm not going to see that pair of pants. However, if I start to shoot from here, here we'll come back and maybe come back to this at some angle. In that case, when I look at the corresponding two curves, which when I seek a bit this, indeed on the right, I will get something which is homotopic to that one, which is a geodesic, and something which is homotopic to that one, which is again the boundary, which is a geodesic. So when I shoot from there, I will, I'm going to see in that particular pair of things. So these sets here, This is why you call these limit points? Because it's either... No, it's a limit point in E in a topological sense. There's a sequence of points in E uh -huh. that converge to them. So all that... So that you're defining O1 as the first point... Uh, as the, u as the that unique happens. point on the side where these spirals. Okay, so one is all of them, not the first one that spirals. Sorry? Or one is, uh, it's just like you picked one, so but... So when you shoot from there, there's only two points where it spirals around that curve. It's this one, and the one which is symmetric will start behind at the same distance. But this, how, how do you know this? This, uh, 
comes from Hyper Geometry of the Pair of Ten. Okay. Just so it is true that it's a, a, a limit twice by the lambda, but it's also true that for each boundary. Yes, but you need behavior for us. Okay. But I insist that, of course, this does this is not interesting to the surface. It's interesting to the pair of F. It depends where is that curve you consider. So here I have O2, which is on the other side, where it's pure again. Here, that's the point which is symmetric, so P1, P2. Here is a symmetric point, okay, O3. Four. So where when you shoot, you will get zero here, it's a different one. And we say that when you shoot the physics from there, we exactly get that pair of plants. When you arrive here, you're spiraling around some boundary component. And that's an analytic point in E, so I put it back in B1 prime. So it's totally allowed. And in that case, indeed, my two curves that I get from seconding this is this boundary and something homotopy to that one. Mm -hmm. So I'm still, still uh, giving, when you shoot from there, still giving you the same Q. So I can continue. Here I'm just going to hit this boundary but at maybe a different angle. When you second, I still use this and that. So all of that is okay. until then. Because if I start to go here, I'm going again to have a geodesic that cross that, nothing special happened, I go away, mm -hmm. and I don't know any more about this curve. So uh, can it be, I ah, know, it cannot be that we have other points such that this spiral uh, with some other close simple geodesic curve that is from out of the it is topic to, to gamma because we can only have one of the two that is so the genetic. It's true that if you take a curve here, so if I have simple, it crosses here, I can continue the curve, and there will be some point where maybe it could spill along some other curve. Uh -huh. But then it's not uh, homotopic to, to gamma anymore. No, uh -huh. it's not anymore. So when we shoot from there, we know we're going to land exactly in this cube. When we shoot from there, all the rest can happen. So the set, so if I denote I, I will call that V um, Q. And the set of X in B1 prime, so that P of X is equal to Q, is this segment I in maybe up to interior I cube. So I do know that big B, we could not big B M, because that corresponds when I choose to look at a given pair of fan which has a boundary B M. Now I could try to look at the other situation where I look at a pair of fan which has two boundaries here interior to the surface. So now instead of just gamma and BM, I have gamma prime and gamma. Then the situation is a bit different because what's so what's happening? If I shoot from there, I'm going to cross that, I continue, I go away, so I'm not corresponding to that curve. If I here have this limited situation where I spiral around that, so it's not in B1 prime. If I'm here, indeed again, the two curves which are obtained by the thickening, they're exactly a homotopy to that one and that one which now isn't anymore a boundary. So all that thing is allowed. But if I continue here, when I shoot, I will see a geodesic that cross somewhere there. It's simple until there, so it continues. And so it goes somewhere else in the surface, you don't see anymore this cube. 
So this happens all the way here. And here are the opposite situation. Now when I start from the other side of the pair of pen, I still have this kind of thing. So that shooting from this green segment is exactly what gives you exactly this Q. Each such Q will appear at some point, because we see the segments are on empty. So we can rewrite that sum that I had before. We can rewrite 1 as 1 over the length of B1, the sum over all the, the Qs which I had before. to evaluate what's the length of these different segments. And this will be one of the sum where we assemble a pair of pens with some explicit functions. There are two cases where you have two boundaries in common and one boundary in common, and that corresponds to the B and C in the original recursion. More precisely, what you also see is that the length of this doesn't depend on the global geometry of the surface. It's only totally something you can determine internally in this pair of pen. And this is why it's computable. The only thing you need to know is the length of this. So let's call that D L1 L gamma, which is that curve. And gamma prime, which is that curve. I also call it gamma prime here, even even it, even so, it could be a boundary. So we want to evaluate this d, and in any case, the length of this segment here. Uh, sorry, why does d depend on gamma prime at all? Sorry, that of this way, the d should depend on L gamma prime. So, you have here this hyperbolic pair of pent. If you cut it into, you have some hexagons. And the metric in the hexagon is totally not determined by three length, okay. which are the boundary length. Uh, mm -hmm. If you change that, you're going to change the metric. Mm -hmm. So, for it depends on the three. And it depends in all the way on the three. So the length of this red piece here is L1 minus that D. L1, L. So in which order? The length here will be L gamma, that third interior curve. And the other length will be Lm, the length of the boundary. For the C case, I just want this green, the length of these two green segments. So I have to remove the length of this and the length of this. But they play a symmetric role. I just exchange gamma and gamma prime. So this is L1 minus DL1. L gamma L gamma prime minus D L one L gamma prime L gamma. So 
Uh, we have to do some type of recruitment. Mm -hmm. So it's like you need to do trigonometry, you have some basic formula you have to learn and prove it once in your life. And then you apply it over and over again by looking at good triangles or here quadrangles or hypercontrols and so on. So you first look at the following figure. So this is orthogonal because where I shoot is pure and pure. This is also orthogonal. So I have one. So this is some kind of degenerate case where you would have a closed polygon. Um, what you're interested in is this length here, which is twice the length of this segment by center. So here you have d over 2. Here you have some lengths which I will call L tilde. And well, these two lengths are infinite. So the, the Bible in this case is the book of Boozer, called the compact on geometry of uh, compact human surfaces, which is all these formulas you need to learn or you need to use. And the one which is relevant here is that in this situation we have the following identity. Cinch of L times cinch of d over 2 is equal to 1. So you know d if you know L tilde, which is the length here. But as I said in a hyperbolic pair of fans, if you know three lengths, you know all the rest. So the way to access this L tilde is to say that you cut along the plane of the blackboard your pair of pens, you get two hyperbolic hexagons. And here, between R and R prime, you have length L1 over 2. It's one side of the boundary. Here you have your length L2 of L. Here you have another on the boundary of the pair which is L gamma over 2. Here you have some other length, which would be the distance between gamma and gamma prime, but I don't need to know it. Here you have a gamma prime over 2. And here you have the distance between these two. So I said that if you know three lengths, like this one, this one, and this one, you have a formula to get out here. So you get the following thing. Cosh of L tilde is cosh is cosh of L. So I should 
actions that is taken. These two play a symmetric role. So that's going to be cosh of algebra prime over two plus cosh algebra over two cosh L1 over two divided by cinch algebra over two cinch and one over two. So what do we what can we say? We can say that zero two is going to be arc cinch of one over cinch of L tilde. So the arc cinch is this. get 1 plus CH L tilde 1 uh, CH L tilde minus 1 and there should be some square root remaining so I can plot the 1 half so I can cancel the 1 half with this. and now I can substitute with this get S1 S2 plus C1 C2 plus C3 divided by minus S1 S2 plus C1 plus C2 plus C3 and this combines well because this is cosh of L1 plus L2 over 2 plus cosh L3 over 2 cosh L1 minus L2 over 2 plus cosh L3 over 2. one can live with it. Uh, it's nice to do another manipulation to write it differently. It's sometimes easier to work. Okay. So I'm going to factor exponential of L1 plus L2 over 2 and here exponential of 
tell you 2 minus L1 over 2. I'm going to expand the Cauch into exponentials. So here, the factors of 2 in the middle of the Cauch can be cancelled. Here I would get a 1 plus exponential of minus L1 minus L2. Here, I factor it, so I have to remove it. I can actually factor. It's, x, it's 1 plus this times 1 plus that. So if I introduce f of x, which is 2 log 1 plus exponential of minus x over 2, I could write that this is But to minus because I will put that in the numerator. There would be a one half. And here there's f of so I say minus that. You probably don't have the one half. And then the numerator the second term does not have the one. That's true. Thank you. So here this is L1 plus oh sorry, I say that if I put numerator first, denominator first, that's why I have a minus. So here we need f of minus L1 plus L2 minus L3 plus f of minus L1 plus L2 plus L3 and then minus f of L1 plus L2 minus L3 minus f of L1 plus L, uh, L1 minus L2 plus L3. So that's another expression for D L1. That's your answer. And so is it just purely manipulation at this level? There's no like overcounting and undercounting of this interval that we can interpret with this F? No. Because if you look again at this picture, I say that whenever I was shooting from, let's say, that, I get that pair of pants. Or, of course, well, there should be the other pair of pants that appear in this picture, but they appear when I shoot over there. So inside there, there are other segments, which are getting this wonderful different pair of pants. So there, there, can, there is no other kind. You just collect for a given pair of pen exactly what comes from that. Yeah. And since from any x you have determined a unique pair of pens, there cannot be any overcome. In fact, 
facts inside the identity here. These I can write as a GR. for B and one and ML, which is equal to Z divided by L1 and C So for C, if you remember in GR, you sum an embedded pair of pants with all the boundaries. But I had a one or two. Here, this gamma and gamma prime in the CK, they're not ordered. So I don't have the one or two here, but I also sum a pair of pants with unordered boundaries in the CKs. So for all, I can just put the one half and all of the boundary for free. So the C function I have in GR should just be that. So we compute what it be. So we have to substitute L2 to be L gamma and Lm here. And you arrive to one over one. So if I write it in terms of this expression here, you get log cosh L M over two, cosh L one plus L M over two, cosh L M over two, cosh. And one minus the gamma over two. And this is also one half of this expression. L one minus D. So F minus L1, L2 here should be replaced by a gamma, plus L2, so L3 is Lm now, so it's going to minus sign, plus L gamma, minus L1 plus Lm plus L gamma. L1 minus Lm plus L gamma. L1 plus Lm minus L gamma. C it's over L1. It's over L1. And C So here the expression looks more complicated. So we have so D itself is L1 minus this expression. So in the end I will get so 1 over L1 minus L1 plus this expression. I have F of minus L1 plus L2 so plus L so L gamma and L gamma prime is L and L prime. Plus minus L1 plus L plus L prime. Minus F of L1 plus L2 minus L minus L prime. 
minus f of minus L1, sorry, plus L1, minus L plus L prime. And then we have to add the same thing where you extend the role of N and N prime. Let's try to order with the variables. So if I extend the role here, I will get minus L plus L prime. This term is the same. Minus L plus L prime. Minus L1 minus L. not symmetric in L and prime. Mm -hmm. So I make average by symmetrization. So here I get the same terms. Okay. Okay. Here let's what you mean this one? No, this the, one. The, the second lines are, are the same. Right. The second lines are the same. Did I do things correctly here? So that line was coming from there. And I should get L1 plus L2. Oh, there was a plus here. This was coming from factorization here. And the effect of this plus is here. So this last term is with a plus, and so it's the same. Whereas here, the only difference, so actually that argument is the opposite of this argument, and the same here. But you notice that f of x minus f of minus x is 2 log 1 plus exponential of minus x over 2 plus 1 exponential of x over 2. You can factor out the exponential of x minus x over 2. You just get minus x. So there's some simplification here, which is that this together with that make some term. So I write aside maybe those two terms we already have with a factor of two. And then I would have this minus L1. This thing here makes uh, L1 plus L, sorry, L1, that's minus x. So L1 minus L plus L prime over 2. And these two things make uh, plus 1 half L1 plus L minus L prime. Minus L1 cancel here, this cancels here, and we just get this product of x. So this is 0, I can just tell you the expression here. And that if I want I can rewrite using the expression of f, which is 2 over L1 log of 1 plus 
and one minus n minus a prime over two. Um, minus a one minus l minus n prime over two, which is also log of exponential of l plus n prime over two plus exponential of n one over two n plus n prime over two exponential minus n one over two. And we're done. So if I summarize what we did, we obtain the following result. You take A equal one. Before we had constant function one and touchdown space of a given surface, we brought it as a sum over a big pair of pens on contributions. And secretly, I can say they multiply the constant function one on touchdown space of the surface minus the pair of pens. That's how you want to see this identity as a recursion. This is essentially the reformulation of the other things here. So if I move just to the left a little bit from O1, yeah. then I'm going to cross, I'm going to intersect myself. And yeah, I guess. And then this intersection point would be like going. So you stop at the intersection point. Until I meet. Uh, uh, until you start to meet this one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So probably can do some small animation on the question. Actually, this. This f function, as far as we know, doesn't have any geometric meaning in terms of length. Like, is it that maybe like it's got nothing to do with the length of maybe no. that change or anything? I don't think so. Okay. As you see, for example, if you have some subtraction of that. Yeah. So this is kind of what I was meaning by the overcounting before. Like, are those top terms of may like overcounting the length at all? So you may try to interpret this subtracting of f as an overcounting. I don't quite know how to do that. Especially because here you see these combinations, and before lengths were positive, but this function takes also negative arguments. And how do you interpret this? It's not. I mean, of course you can convert it into positive argument by this identity, and then the function has a less than nice expression. So I, I don't know to make it. Uh, I would say for me the, the reason why I write it this way is that. For example, when you want to do a class transform, it's easier. Um, and second, if you want to prove admissibility, which is what I will come here, it's also easier. So there's two remarks. The first one is that all what I did here was also valid for the torus with one boundary. On the torus with one boundary, um, when you have a pair of pants, um, it just corresponds to fix 
and simple closed curve. In that case, the pair of pen is not embedded, but its interior is embedded. It meets itself. So in that case, the Mirzahani identity says that one is, so that situation, these two curves, I mean the two sides, they're interior to the surface. So it's like a C situation before. What I mean by this is that when I discuss Swiss geodesic corresponding to that pair of pen, it's like in the C situation. So I use the same function. So here we have the sum of all simple closed curves, which are not homotopic to the boundary, of a C function. So usually in geometric recursion, we just tell you D, which is the case of the first one, but is part of the initial layer. This is because sometimes in quantum field theory, you need some kind of renormalization. The torus thing is a bit ill-defined. So if you don't want to bother too much with the law of axiomatics, you can just say you have to provide the initial layer. But in some applications like here, you can also produce the D as a result of is removing pairs of pens. And here you use the function C. So if you just have given A, B, C with good properties, you can also induce some D by this type of formulas. It's not restricted to any other any case. But in general, you could imagine that D is a bit independent. So, sorry, if you assume admissibility or C, yeah. That that sum is convergent in yeah. general? Okay. So you always have a canonical. Because D. you just have the sum of all simple cross curves. You know that the number of simple cross curves of length bounded by lambda grows polynomially with lambda. Um, and your assumption on C is that it decays faster than any polynomial in the sum of these two lengths. So that kills the polynomial growth on the number of curves. And do you have any interesting example in which D, D is not given by that formula? Mm, so, we don't have so many for the moment totally worked out interesting examples of energy recursion when you know what it computes. I think. So I totally see that the, the, there should be a freedom to have different D. There could be some problems. But so far, the number of examples that where we fully understand on both sides what the recursion is, what initial data is, what's interpretation, is too limited to to the out of this. Like in the computation of the heavy structures? Uh, yes, it's a bit like this. You can always have some kind of yeah, so indeed. So to explain a little bit what Alessandro means is that maybe in some later talk at the reading group, then there would be the question what happens when you take the geometric recursion functions on Titan space? So on modulite space because they're in line. And what happens when you integrate them over the modulite space? Uh, in that case you obtain something simpler called the topological recursion. Um, and in this recursion, A, B, C, they appear as integral kernel for the recursive for the recursion operators. And um, you can actually what probability it is. Um, you can find sufficient condition for these integral kernels from A, B, C to produce something which is symmetric in all the boundaries in the topological recursion. And that's more or less what's called quantum restructures. And um, there's also a condition that D has to, has to satisfy. Like the integral of D has to satisfy. Um, and if you were speaking to a very specific case, you could somehow try to trace B. So B has three entries. Try to take a kind of trace on the two last entries. Um, 
That would be if we had defined a solution. If ABC satisfies um, conditions, then D defined by this way would satisfy would also satisfy a condition. Uh, the problem is that uh, for this ABCD that come here, this trace of B is not well defined. Um, so you don't have your solution. So you have to provide it differently. And actually, what was surprising in this context is that here, for the torus, you use C, you don't use B. And that's what makes it work. But we don't have an analog of that in quantum structures. So it is a bit motivated by that that we didn't want to include D from the beginning uh, as obtained from ABC. So that's the first remark. And the second remark is that when I, we proved that, we didn't talk about admissibility. In fact, we wrote one as a sum of positive terms. So the sum of positive terms, whether it's plus infinity or it's finite. And here, by construction, it must be finite. It's actually equal to one. So you know, I didn't need to prove any kind of admissibility. However, imagine you don't know about the other honey result. And somebody gives you this function here and tell you when you consider this sum of a of n in this way, it's going to be finite. You have to prove, you may be interested in trying to prove independently this is true. So that's what I will sketch now. So these initial data actually are admissible in the GR sense, and I think you talked about that. Mm -hmm. But not about, uh, not the academy, but about the admissibility in general. In fact, you also see why the admissibility conditions are written in the way that Nadino wrote them. With this complicated plus function distinguishing whether L1 plus L2 is bigger than L and so on. And the motivation comes from this example. DC decay conditions. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. If it's fine, then this will be good. So one can give an independent proof that on a gas sigma for the other honey initial data. Ignoring, you know, it's equal to one. Uh, is well defined. So can I ask something? Because you said like the, the data admissible, but in the paper is the, the this notion of M admissibility, which is slightly different. Yeah, it's the old version of the paper. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. It's why when I send you the draft okay. on which you base your, your talks, there was this uh, other definition of admissibility, which are more complicated, which is mm -hmm. plus function. Okay, and that's that is satisfied by the And mm -hmm. that's weaker than the one which was before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the good one. Okay, so we already used the, the good one. So in the new version of the paper, there will not be any more this invisibility, which is some complication where you didn't understand enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe first look at C, which is a bit simpler. So did I erase C? So I could start with this, but I prefer that. So C L1 L L prime is two over L1, one over L1. F minus L1 plus L plus L prime. that when L and L prime 
without it, we have to decay. But we have to distinguish two cases. And then this is bigger than one, or this is smaller than one. In that case, I won't decay faster than any power in L plus L prime minus L1. In that case, I just want that the function is bounded. So that's what you expect. Okay, so we have to look at this function S. So when x is positive, you can use the approximation log of 1 plus u is smaller than u. And you get f of x, which is always positive, is smaller than that. So it decays exponentially. When x is negative, well, this is very large. But here, if you can convert it into a negative argument using the identity of b4. This is f of minus x plus well, minus x. So that I can write. Um, so this, in fact, is also smaller than 2. Mm -hmm. And this minus x is just plus absolute value of x. So in that case, well, f is positive, so let's forget about that. And here, I can just use this. So c, so c is positive. That we knew because it had some relative interpretation in terms of some length. So I can say that c is more than 2 over L1 exponential of minus L plus L prime minus L1 over 2. That's what that was in that case. It's five decays faster than any polynomial. Now in this case, so the situation is a bit different. i rather have I use the same thing, 1 over L1, L1 minus L plus L prime, come from there, plus 2. This is negative, so it's also 1 plus 2 over L1. And here, in the decay assumption that I need, I assume all my lengths are bounded away from zero by some absolute. And here you see what I need then, because I have this one array of one. So I would totally screw up if some length was going to zero. So this is smaller than some two or epsilon this, and that would be working. And here I can say it's more than this over all of these sets is bounded as I wanted. So this is okay. So for B, I will leave it as an exercise. It's a similar manipulation with the S. Another important thing you can use that F is decreasing. So you have four terms of f, and you have two. Okay. So that proves the visibility. And so that proves from the way. All the GR series uniformly on every complex.
so this is the main reason why we, uh, we see uh, the diagonal space as the limit, the diagonal limit limits of this T epsilon, right? Because <coughs> we need it for... Exactly. So um, when you do these estimates, you only have controls of B and C over the sets where you control by below the length. Okay. Because so this you do estimates there. Mm -hmm. And then, well, if you have convergence on any compact anyway, it's on any compact of this set for a fixed epsilon, that implies convergence on any compact. So for simple convergence on all fractional space, and then uh, convergence on any compact as well. So indeed, it's useful for that reason to take a topology coming from the projective limit of this T sigma epsilon. some function on tractional space. You don't know what is this function. You would have an identity if you would know independently what is this function. Uh, so can independently define functions on functional space, which are mapping to the environment. be obtained by the R. And uh, so here is one example. We're going to look at statistics of length of simple multiple. So let S sigma, the set of all simple closed multi-curves without multiplicities. So what does that mean? Curve is uh, embedded in S1. And actually, when we say that, we always look at things up to isotopy. So we can always replace that by looking at a geodesic representative. So the simple cross curve I consider here, which are multi curve, multi curve is one component, is just 
such a curve which is not homotopy to a boundary and doesn't cross itself. The multi curve is just a disjoint union of such. The collection, non ordered set of simple closed curves. None of them is homotopy to the boundary. None of them is homotopy to one boundary. So that would be forbidden. They cannot cross each other. And I don't repeat. I don't go over that one several times. That's what we do not belong to the So if I have such a simple closed multi curve, uh, the number of components of this multi curve, if I have a surface of just G with n boundaries, must be smaller than 3G minus 3 plus n. The reason is that let's try to put the maximum number of multi curves. So here I could do that, here I could do another one here. And now when I cut all those multi curves. That's a little bit. Which one? Uh -huh. The two rightmost. Right. Stop. So G equal one. Sorry, g equal 2 and equal 1. So this number here should be 6 minus 3, 3 plus 1, 4. And that's what I have here. When you count along these multi curves, you get exactly a pair of fan decomposition. If you take an arbitrary multi curve, cut along them. If you see some component which is not a pair of fans, you're going to be able to find a simple cross curve inside that's not homotopy to any of the boundary of that thing. So any of the component you have before. So you can take that one and cut continue. And at the very end, you just get a pair of fan decomposition. And the number of boundaries of a pair of fan decomposition, if I don't know those ones, is exactly 3G minus 3 plus n by some other characteristic computation. So we look at this subject. Is your gamma is just one, and just a simple curve. function on the modular space. First, I take the test function from R plus to R, and I'm going to assume it decays fast enough.
And then these you can obtain from node recursion. That so I was denoting A, B, C, and we have to denote A, M, B, M, C, M. And the function I get in the other Here I have to consider the following initial data. The new A that depends on F is just A in the honey, which is equal to 1. The new B, which depends on three lengths, L1, L2, L. Is going to be near the honey bee plus t f of l a of near the honey, which is one. It's more instructive to write it this way. C f is the function c of near the honey plus t f of L, the function B of the other L1, L, L prime. But C anyway has to be symmetric in those two variables. So I have to put the symmetrization of that. And D, well, the initial data D is just the function I want for the first with one number. So I'm cheating, I'm just writing D is that. So take this initial data. It is not hard to see that because f has this very strong decay, since bmcm was admissible, this bfcf is also admissible. And when you run gr, you get some omega f, which equal to the function big F, which I define independently. The proof of this is actually much simpler than all we've done so far. function 1 on Teichmann space of the surface minus the multicurve. But if I know this, here I can use me as a high identity, or I can use geometric recursion. So what I can run is f sigma is the sum of multi-curves, simple multi-curves, of this weight, and then the sum of all homotopy class of family zero pens um, of the function which I'll denote x xm, the formula is a lang and a b or a c depending on what is p. And here of course that's in sigma minus gamma. So I have to be a bit careful here. When I write sigma minus gamma, it might be a disconnected surface, but the first boundary of sigma is in some component. So what I really write here is just the gr for that component that contains the first boundary. And the rest I just write 
my one, the rest of the component. And now, these sums are absolutely convergent, so I can exchange them. And the importance of saying that we have simple closed curves, simple closed multi curve, is that really I can cut. Sigma minus gamma indeed is a bordered surface, not a bordered surface with corners. So I remain in the same category. Um, so since P is in sigma minus gamma, it's never going to cross gamma. In other words, when I remove P, gamma should be in the rest of the surface. However, there are several cases. It could be that gamma is actually part of the boundary of P somewhere. So I have to draw the different possibilities. So here is P. I could be in that situation where a gamma has no component in common with P. So in that case, I can be in that situation, which would be an A, so what shall I draw in plain line are the boundaries, so that only occur when the surface is just a pair of pets. Y can be in that situation where I have my boundary BM and some interior curve, net BM. And well, the last situation where I have two interior curves, that's CM. So indeed, that's true. When f of sigma, I look at the convolution of the empty multi curve, I get 1. In that case, I should just see this 1 reproduced by Miyazahani identity. It's a coefficient of t to the 0. Now, when gamma has one boundary and one component equal to boundary of p, so here is the 1. And then I could have this situation. So in yellow, this in yellow, this is going to be a component of gamma, of beta. In that case, so gamma consists of beta plus other components which are in the rest of the surface. So if I want to single out this component, the contribution to the weights is going to be. Well, that's a B situation first. But the weight in the function f is t times small f of L beta. Is it A times? Yeah, it's not correct. Because the way P occurs is when I, re when I cut out a pair of pen in sigma minus gamma. So then, in, every time I in in, if I'm in that situation, the pair of pen I cut out is that thing. It's already this component, it's already a 0, 3. It's already a pair of pens. So in that case, that must be an A which appears there. But now, so here that appeared as an A, but then when I write it as a sum like that, this becomes a B situation. 
because that curve now is interior. So that would be a contribution to B. So this is this term. There is another possibility, which is that you have some interior curve here. Oh, yeah, maybe delta. And here you have your component gamma. So beta is a component of gamma, and the rest of gamma is on the surface. In that situation, here, I have P embedded as something like that, and now beta is a, is a boundary of sigma minus gamma. So that's a B in there. That's a B L1, L beta, L delta, T times F of L beta from the weights of the length of multi curves. And this is now going to be because these two curves are interior when I look at it from the perspective of sigma, is going to be a contribution to C. The last case I have to analyze is when gamma has two components in common. See? So it must be that situation where I have a component here, a component here. In sigma minus the surface, minus the multi curve. This is the component carrying beta 1, and that's a pair of pent. So here I should, use, I should use an A, L1, L beta, L beta prime. And the weight from the multi curve is T squared, F of L beta, F of L beta prime. And then the rest of the weight is factored in F of sigma minus P. And that's a contribution to C because, in the sum, because there are two inner components. So that's all the solution you have. If you put everything together, pay attention to the symmetry factors, you get this expression. And the other thing you learn from the proof, so one message maybe to, to take away, once you know the Zahani identity, you can use it as a partition of unity to generate other identities. And more generally, if you have geometry recursion, I could also consider a different function where I take any initial data for the geometry recursion and I put in omega sigma minus gamma here. It's given by GR for some ABCD. I can insert GR as a partition of unity here, manipulate, and I will get a similar theorem as here, except that my reference BMCM will be replaced by the initial data I started with. So once you know what GR computes for some ABCD, you can generate what it computes for any, by, uh, for any of these twists using any test function like that. So by saying by length of multi that's all. Is there any questions? Just the test function you should maybe imagine is something like constant one and then zero if you want to really do statistics. So. Yeah, exactly. If you want to count how many of them are exponent, you can do that. And so it, it has to be 
continuous and not to be ordered. So, right. good question. In a way, you formulated GR uh, to prove convergence on any some topology, so when you continuous function, that works. Uh, you may wonder what happens if I don't assume something continuous. You have to redo all the steps defining the topology, proving it's complete, and so on. So, it might be possible, I'm not totally sure it's possible with measurable functions, maybe. But something you can do is rather measure it. Um, so, some of this, which is the kind of dual of functions with compact support. Uh, so, it contains a delta function, for instance. So, this heavy side stuff will also be okay. Um, and that's, I check that it works. And do you have an example of GR? Uh, with target theory, which is something like uh, differential forms? This is hard. And that's hard for uh, the reason that when you have differential form, you're never going to define norms. So you won't say, oh, you might maybe want to, um, so what kind of norms you can define? Maybe some kind of L2 norm using the metric, or testing against some vector fields. You can take arbitrary vector fields, test against that. But then the problem is when you glue, there's a natural glue in math for differential forms using push forward. It's much more natural actually than just the gluing of functions. However, you have to prove these maps are continuous. This is hard. We don't know how to do it. Is the, the hope would be to construct a, a, a classes of differential forms on modalities? So if you could prove this natural growing map or maybe some modification of it in some topology, whatever topology is continuous, then you would get differential forms and cohomology classes via GR. For the moment, the diff we think such a thing exists, but the difficulty for the moment has been to define properly the topology in which these growing maps are continuous. And even in the 0-4 case, when you take two pairs of and you glue them together, uh, we find it a bit hard to, to prove. Okay, then let's, speak, let's thank the speaker again.